Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Ramsey Adcock, and a very warm welcome to our morning service from Jesmond Parish Church in Newcastle. As you can see, my son Josh is helping me this morning, and we're also joined by Richard and Claire Restall, who are doing the readings, and Mark Nicholson, who will be leading our prayers. Andy Gorn continues our Kids Talk series in Job. No, it's Job. No, it's not Job, it's Job. Uh -huh. And Jonathan Pryke is preaching in our series in 1 Corinthians. So as we begin, let's pray. Heavenly Father, in our worship, help us to sing your praise, confess our sins, hear your word, and bring our prayers to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our music was recorded at Keswick Convention, and our first song helps us to praise the Lord, the Almighty, the King of Creation. <laughs> We all fail, don't we, to love the Lord our God with all our heart and our soul and our strength. And we don't treat one another in the way that we should. Every one of us has sinned. But our God is a God of mercy. And all we need to do is to say sorry and trust that because of Jesus and his death in our place on the cross, we'll be forgiven. Our sins are washed clean and we receive the Holy Spirit who makes it possible for us to have a changed life. And so confident of that truth, we pray together now our confession prayer. Almighty God, God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our fellow men in thought and word and deed, in the evil we have done and in the good we have not done, through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. 
Listen now to these amazing words from the Bible that help us to be sure that God forgives us when we say sorry. This is 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. But if we confess our sins to God, he can always be trusted to forgive us and to take our sins away. And so Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. It's almost time for Andy Gorn to continue our series in Job. Job. Ah. But first, here is Richard Restall with our first Bible reading. Good morning, everyone. Today's first reading is from Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 1 to verse 10. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of the valley. He was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them. But there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet an exceedingly great army. Hi. Last week we looked at Job chapter 1, and we thought about how Job was very, very rich and had such a great life, and even though Job loved and trusted in the Lord God, God allowed Satan to take away pretty much everything he had in one terrible, terrible day. And we thought about this question. Can God be trusted when life is tough? Well, Job did keep trusting in God. He didn't turn his back on God, even though Job didn't know why, why all this was happening to him. Well, today we're going to look into chapters two and three. So here's Job and he's lost pretty much everything. Uh, but Satan hasn't finished with him. No, he wants to have another try at stopping Job from trusting in God. Because you remember that Satan is God's enemy and wants more than anything to stop us from trusting in him. So this is what he said to him on the second occasion. Ah, you see, Job only trusts you because he's healthy. If you make him really ill, he'll stop trusting in you. So I wonder what God replied. Well, it was something like this. OK, we'll see. I'll allow you to make Job ill but you must not kill him. Did you notice that again? God allows Satan to make Job very ill, but no more than that. Because remember, Satan can only do what God allows him to do. Well, Job knows nothing about this argument between God and Satan. What happened to him is that he started to get all these boils, these sores all over his skin from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head. His whole body was itching and sore and bleeding and bad. 
And he was in such a stinking mess that he went and socially isolated himself by sitting on the rubbish heap outside of the town. And he sat there scraping away at his skin using a piece of broken pot. And that's when we get one person's answer to this question of why. Why is all this happening to Job? And it comes from his wife. Yeah. Because Job's wife has also suffered, hasn't she? I mean, she's lost all that wealth as well. And she's lost her family. And this is what she says to Job. You are still as faithful as ever, aren't you? Why don't you curse God and die? In other words, Job, why are you still holding on to God? Why are you still trusting in him? You see, what she's thinking is this that God is nasty. Yeah, Job, God is just nasty. He doesn't deserve for you to keep trusting in him. So just tell him you're going to walk away from him and then just go and die, Job. Ouch. Well, actually, many people think something like that, don't they? They think, how could you believe in a God who would allow such terrible things to happen? Like wars and earthquakes and, and floods and viruses and abuse. God must be pretty nasty to allow all those things to happen. Or maybe they think something like this. God is moody. You know, like uh, God's in a good mood one day, so he's kind and generous to people. And then another day he's in a bad mood, and so he's mean and nasty and horrible to people. But hang on, because... In that discussion between God and Satan that Job and his wife don't know anything about, God is never moody or nasty. He allows Satan to take those things away from Job to show that Job is not trusting in God because of what God gives him, but because God deserves our love and our trust. Well, this is what Job replies to his wife. You are talking nonsense. When God sends us something good, we welcome it. How can we complain when he sends us trouble? Amazingly, Job is still trusting in God. And Satan has failed. But... That does not mean that Job is all smiley and happy. Of course he isn't. Job's in total despair. I mean, he felt like there was nothing to look forward to, like nothing good would ever happen to him again. In fact, he feels that life isn't worth living anymore. Have a look at this. I wish I had died in my mother's womb or died the moment I was born. Instead of eating, I mourn. And I can never stop groaning. I have no peace, no rest, and my troubles never end. You see, Job isn't pretending. Job is telling God exactly how he feels, depressed, like he wishes he'd never been born. But actually, that's a good thing, isn't it? Because who's he talking to? God. See, he has a relationship with God and he's telling God exactly how he feels, even though he feels like this. And God is always ready to listen. And, you know, when we pray to God and tell him how we're feeling, he does totally understand. How? Well, because God came to do something about the problem of suffering. And the way he did that was to suffer. You see, God came down to this earth as the person of Jesus. And Satan was allowed to use rejection and torture and the most unimaginable pain as Jesus was nailed to that cross and left to die. And he did that so that we could have a relationship with him and look forward to the day when one day God will bring to an end suffering for his people. So can God be trusted when life is tough? Yes, he can, because he totally understands. And one day he will bring our suffering to an end for his people. Let's pray together. 
Father God, thank you that Job kept trusting in you and thank you that you understand our suffering much more than we can imagine. Help us to keep trusting in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. And now let's sing our next song together. And he's just reminded us there, hasn't he, how great it is that we can talk to our Heavenly Father who can be trusted, that we can talk to him knowing that he listens and answers us. And we're going to pray now. We're going to begin with the Lord's Prayer before Mark Nicholson leads us in a time of prayer. Uh, So let's pray together now. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us all that is... Past. Lord, forgive us all sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Hi, good morning. Let's pray. Almighty God, whose Son Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life of all who put their trust in him, Raise us, we pray, from the death of sin to the life of righteousness, 
that we may seek the things which are above, where he reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your steadfast love for the world. Thank you that you did not deal with us as we deserved, but loved us so much that you sent your Son into the world to pay the terrible price for our sins and bring us into your family as your dearly loved children. Thank you that as your adopted children we can talk to you whenever we want. And thank you that you delight not only to hear us, but to answer our prayers. Lord, we pray that you would have mercy on your broken and damaged world. We pray for nations and governments all over the world that are struggling to deal with the spread of the coronavirus. We pray that you would give wisdom to local and national leaders in each country as they make decisions to prevent the spread of the virus, to care for those who are suffering from its effects and to protect those who are most vulnerable. We pray specifically for our Prime Minister that you would grant him a full recovery from the effects of the virus and for our leaders in national and local government that you would enable them to make the best decisions they can and to plan and act in the best interests of everyone. We pray that you would sustain and protect all those who work in the NHS and social care sector, in particular that there would be adequate supplies of personal protective equipment for everyone who needs it. We pray for your comfort for all those who have been bereaved. We pray for those who are isolated and alone at this time, that you would provide people to establish and maintain contact with them. And we thank you, Father, for the technology that enables us to continue to meet together as a church and also enables us to stay in touch with our families and friends. Lord, we thank you that you are the sovereign ruler of the universe and nothing happens in the world without your permission. Father, we don't always understand why things like this happen, but we pray that you would help your people all over the world to continue to trust that you are working out your purposes through these difficult and challenging times. And we pray too that you would enable us to witness to the world about the one who is the resurrection and the life. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counsellor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Jonathan Pryke will shortly continue our new sermon series in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And don't forget we've got resources for our younger viewers and the information below this video. Uh, so for those who are too young to sit through the sermon, why not pause the video and print it out for them? But for now, here is Claire Restall with our second Bible reading. Good morning. Our second reading is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 to 19. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Sure. 
Hello and good morning. Before we go any further, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your living word. Help us by your spirit to understand it, take it to heart and live it out. In Jesus' name, Amen. I wonder if you've seen the quiz, The Unbelievable Truth. The contestants take it in turn to sell to tell an amusing pack of lies on a particular topic, but they sneak in amongst the lies a few statements that sound unbelievable and untrue, but which in fact are true. And the other panelists get points by spotting them. The resurrection is like that. It sounds incredible and untrue an unbelievable claim that becomes believable 
as it dawns on us that it is in fact true. We're back to our series learning from chapter 15 of the Apostle Paul's first letter to the Corinthians and the section we've come to today is verses 12 to 19 of 1 Corinthians 15. My title is The Results of the Resurrection and that's what the Apostle is talking about here but he does it by considering the opposite. He's doing a kind of mental experiment to make his point. So he's asking what if there were no resurrection? What if Jesus was not raised bodily from the grave? What then? And the reason he's talking like that is because that's precisely what some people were saying at that time in Corinth, that resurrection simply cannot happen. Whether that's the resurrection of Jesus or the resurrection of everyone when Christ returns. After all, they well knew 2,000 years ago that dead people stay dead. The immensity of that claim that Jesus had been raised was clear. And there were those who simply could not stomach that claim of resurrection. Take a look at verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Paul wanted to drive home to these resurrection deniers just how wrong they were and just how serious and deadly their mistake was. So in the rest of this passage, Paul comes up with a series of ifs followed by a massive but. And it's there at the start of verse 30. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. I want then to spell out what he's saying are the results of the resurrection in verses 13 to 19. And I want to do that in four main headings. So, first, because Christ has been raised, the dead will be raised. Here's verse 13. But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And he emphasizes the point in verse 16. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. So he's got two resurrections in view here, the resurrection of Jesus and also the resurrection of all believers on the last day. And he's making the point that the two are very closely connected. You can't have one without the other. Why is that? It's because the resurrection of Jesus is the beginning of the resurrection of us all. This wretched virus we're trying to cope with illustrates this. There was a day, not so very long ago, when the virus was transmitted for the very first time from an animal to a person. One person. Without that happening, no crisis. But when it did happen, just once, given the virulence of the virus and its vicious effects on the vulnerable, the rest followed inevitably. That one case of animal to human transmission brought an explosion of viral infection bringing disease and death to the world. By wonderful contrast, when the one bodily resurrection of Jesus happened, the rest inevitably followed a far, far greater explosion of life that will come to full fruition with the bodily resurrection to eternal life of all those who are trusting in him. Because Jesus has been raised, the dead will be raised. Hallelujah! Secondly, because Christ has been raised, the gospel is powerful. In another of his great letters to the Romans, the Apostle Paul spells out the explosive impact of the gospel. Romans chapter 1 verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And now Paul spells out four 
connected implications of the truth of this good news. Again, by contrast with what would be the case if it were not true. Verse 14. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. And then link to that verses 17 and 18. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. So, one, our evangelism is effective. Paul says in verse 14, And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. But it's not in vain, because Christ has been raised. Paul's preaching of the cross and the resurrection was not in vain. And to prove the point, if you're a believer, all you have to do is take a look at yourself. 2,000 years on, and the Apostles' God-given gospel has reached you and brought you to saving faith in the risen Lord Jesus. You are the result of the resurrection. And if you're not yet a believer, think about this. Through all the centuries since, nothing has been able to stamp out the good news of the death of Jesus for our sins and his bodily resurrection on that third day. And today, the promise of that gospel has reached you. Your sins can be forgiven and you can receive eternal life for yourself the moment you put your trust in Jesus and believe in him as your Saviour and as your Lord. Our evangelism is effective too. Our faith is fruitful. Verse 14, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is in vain. And again, verse 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. But in fact, Christ has been raised. So our faith in him is neither vain nor futile. It is neither fruitless nor useless. And we need to know that because it can very easily feel as if our faith is both fruitless and useless. Why is that? It's because fruit takes time to come to fruition. And in the meantime, we can't see the results. Last weekend, I sowed out flower and vegetable seeds in pots and trays. It's that time of year. And I have faith that those seeds will grow and be fruitful or vegetable. Why is that? Well, because it tells me they will on the seed packet, but also because I've done it many times before and I know that this works. And in fact, already some of the flower seeds have popped right up. No flowers yet, of course, but I can see that something's happening. But what about all the rest? Nothing. I have to wait and not give up and keep watering. So it is with our faith in Jesus and all the sacrifice and service that flows from it. Maybe it all seems hard and with little or no good results, but the fruit will come. So when we get to the end of this whole chapter, the Apostle's going to leave us with these words ringing in his ears. This is from verse 58 at the end of chapter 15. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labour is not in vain. Our evangelism is effective, our faith is fruitful. Three, our debts are dealt with. Verse 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Even the death of Jesus without the resurrection was not enough on its own. The wages of sin is death, and death was conquered when Jesus rose from the dead. Without the resurrection, we would still be in our sins, still under condemnation. 
Jesus often talked about our sin as like a huge debt that must be paid if we are to go free. So getting free from our sin is like a bill being paid. The other day I bought a birthday present for Vivian, a bit late admittedly, but we'll let that pass. I paid for it when I bought it. And then a while later, the email came through confirming my order and confirming that the bill had been paid. There was nothing left to pay, either by me or by Vivian, who was to receive the gift. When Jesus died, the debt that we owe our Heavenly Father because of our sin was paid once and for all. And when he was raised on that third day, it was like the invoice arriving with written on it in black and white, paid for, nothing to pay. The gift is on its way. That's what the resurrection does. It's our guarantee that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ for all eternity. Because Christ has been raised then, our evangelism is effective, our faith is fruitful, our debts are dealt with, and four, our faithful dead have not died. Verse 17 and on to 18. And if Christ has not been raised, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Or to turn that on its head, on its head because Jesus has been raised, those who have died trusting in Jesus have not, in fact, perished. They are safe with Jesus. Their bodies have died, but even that is only temporary while they wait for the resurrected eternal bodies that they're going to get when Jesus comes back again. There's a moving song that you could find on the internet that tries to put into words this wonderful truth. Anne Atkins wrote it recently after her elderly father died. His family and friends sang and played it in a kind of virtual choir and a band because they couldn't gather together for his funeral as a result of the lockdown. Speaking of the risen Jesus, the song says, He will wipe all tears away. He will shine as bright as day. He will make creation new for his words are sure and true. You can find that song if you just Google Anne Atkins song. Give it a listen. So our evangelism is effective, our faith is fruitful, our debts are dealt with, and our faithful dead have not died. Such is the power of the gospel. Then my next main heading is this. So thirdly, because Jesus has been raised, the apostolic faith is God's truth. Take a look at verse 15. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. That is, if resurrection were impossible, and so hasn't happened to Jesus, then I, Paul, would be lying through my teeth when I say that I saw Jesus alive. And what is more, I'd be making God out to be a fraud, because I said that God had done it. But God is true, and I am no liar, because it did really happen. So the gospel that the apostles preach to the world and that we read in the pages of the New Testament is God's truth. We can with confidence rest the whole weight of our lives on it. Finally and fourthly, because Christ has been raised, we have hope not just for now, but for all eternity. This is verse 19. If if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Those are really strong words. Paul knows that the Christian life is hard. He was himself bashed and beaten and pushed from pillar to post all the way through his Christian life until the end he was executed. 
and yet he was full of joy. Why? Because of his hope of resurrection through the Lord Jesus. We do need to be clear that Christian hope is above all future hope. Yes, we experience great blessings in this life, but without that massive future hope, present hardships would outweigh present blessings. If Jesus was not raised, we are living deluded lives, but he was, so our hope is sure. It's exactly 50 years since the amazing Apollo 13 mission to the moon. Uh, so there's another great film for your lockdown viewing. I've been listening to the voices of those involved in that mission on the World Service podcasts that have been telling the story. On its way to the moon, there was an explosion in the Apollo 13 command module that caused it to stop functioning. The three astronauts had to get back to Earth using the landing craft that was designed to take them down to the moon. And they went through an extraordinary series of crises and the living conditions that they had to exist in became almost intolerable. But one thing kept them going, the hope that they would get safely back down to Earth. For them it was not a certain hope, but it was enough. Life following Jesus can be hard. He never promised that it would be otherwise. But we do have a certain hope, the hope of new creation, the hope of bodily resurrection. Jesus has given us that hope because he has been raised from the dead. Hallelujah. Let's bow our heads to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you raised your son Jesus to life on the third day. And because of him, we too will one day share in his resurrection life. While we wait, teach us, we pray, to keep going and to keep trusting in the sure and certain hope that our faith and our labours are not in vain. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
We've been reminded from God's word that because Christ has been raised, we have a certain hope. These may be difficult times, but we know that we've been promised new bodies and we know that the time will come where there'll be no more tears or death or mourning or pain anymore. Now, of course, it may be that you've still got lots of questions about the Christian faith and about God. And if so, I'd love for you to join our online discussion group called Christianity Explored. We've got a group starting tomorrow night at 7.30 on Zoom, but we can also run groups as needed um, at, at other times. Uh, during the course, we watch a short video and there's lots of time for discussion. It's a really good way to think things through a little bit more with a few others. And if you'd like to join that group, please email jonathan.redfern at church.org.uk if you'd like to join. Or do look up our website, Jesmyn Parish Church, and you can get in touch with us uh, through that. Well, let me end with a final prayer. So may God the Father, by whose glory Christ was raised from the dead, strengthen you to walk with him in his risen life. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Well, there'll be some notices in a few moments for those at JPC, but if you're leaving us now, can I say thank you for joining us this morning and please come again and join us uh, uh, tonight at 6.30 as we continue through our series in the book of Revelation. And then again next Sunday at 10.30 for our series as we continue through 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Well, for those at JPC, welcome back. Uh, I'd like to encourage you to all keep connecting with one another at church. And of course, straight away after the service at 11.40, we have our weekly virtual coffee time on Zoom. Don't miss uh, this great opportunity once a week to listen to some interviews from others at our church and to, to speak together and meet together in small groups uh, afterwards. But however you do it, find some way to make contact with someone else soon to catch up and to pray for one another. That may be with your small group. It may be one of the midweek daily prayer meetings we're having at Zoom at one o'clock every day uh, during the week. Or just call someone else you know from church. However you do it, please make that effort to connect with one another. And if you're not in a small group and you'd like to do that, uh, then get in touch with us. And if you'd like details of how to join that one o'clock prayer meeting every day, then just send me an email and I'll send that right back. Uh, and please let us know on the staff if you've got symptoms of COVID-19 or if you require any help or support or encouragement. And don't forget that our Celebrate Recovery group is still running uh, using uh, technology. And if you're struggling with hurt or pain or addictions of any kind, there is a Christ-centered program that's helping people find help from hurts and habits and hang-ups. And if you'd like more information about that, then of course contact Catherine Robinson. Well, finally, if you're able to record a short video uh, with a greeting or of you saying the Apostles' Creed, that'd be really great. Uh, details were sent in the weekly email or you can get in touch with me, uh, but that'd be really helpful. I'd be uh, looking forward to seeing the fruits of that in the coming weeks. Well, that's all for now. Keep in touch. Please stay safe and let's rejoice that Christ has risen from the dead. Hi, I'm Rod, the Minister of Holy Trinity Gates here and welcome to this virtual service. Oh, can I help you with the actions? So it's cast, do a fishing rod, your cares, do a sad face. It's lovely to join you today. Our reading today is from the NIV and it's Psalm 131. I know, I bet Eunice taught him his times tables. Yeah, you know. What do we do when the bottom drops out of our world? Well, as Christians, we are uniquely positioned to handle these things because God has given us incredible resources to cope with things just like this.